Okay, so hey everyone, I'm Angela and I'll be going through lower limb anatomy today. So before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge previous revision lectures and also PSP slides for giving me a lot of inspiration for this, um, for this presentation. So I hope you guys have been through a lot of the bones and the muscles of the lower limbs before. So instead I'd like to go through and revise some anatomy of the important spaces, but also the neurovasculature as I think these are quite important for guessing the presentation of common pathologies. And I'm also gonna go through the clinical significance of some anatomical structures, and I've got some practice questions as well. So I'm not gonna cover them. And I just like to have a bit on how I like to study anatomy. So MSK is a lot of memorizing, memorizing each muscle where they sit and what their function is. So instead, I like to visualize where each muscle sits, as well as the course of all the nerves and arteries. And then from there, you can logically work out the innervation and the movements of muscles and also possible areas where structures could get damaged. Okay, so before I talk about um, the spaces, I'd like to start with the ligaments of the pelvis. So this will be a little bit of a pop quiz, since I think you guys might know this. Firstly, what's this ligament here? Feel free to pop it in the chat or just have a think about it. So if in doubt, you can just guess by what it's attached to. So we can see that it's attached from the sacrum to the ilium and it's on the anterior side. So that would be the anterior sacroiliac ligament. Because it's called anterior, it means that we've also got a posterior sacroiliac ligament and these help to stabilize the sacroiliac joint. Okay, next. This one here connects the sacrum to the ischial tuberosity. This is the lowest part of your pelvis and it's what you're currently sitting on. So this here would be the sacrotuberous ligament. We've also got the pubic symphysis here. This one here connects the sacrum to the ischial spine. So that's just the pointy part on the back of your pelvis. So that's the sacrospinous ligament. And lastly, we've got the ligament that connects the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle. And this here is the inguinal ligament. Okay, so most names are based on attachments. And some important ones would be the sacrospinous and the sacrotuberous ligament. Because if you remember, on the back of your pelvis, we've got a greater sciatic notch as well as a lesser sciatic notch. Your sacrospinous ligament will separate these two notches and your sacrotuberous ligament, this one here, will close them off. So we get the formation of two foramen. These are just holes where a lot of um, structures can pass through. And our inguinal ligament, that's the one on the front, is important for our femoral triangle. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about some important spaces. Remember the greater sciatic foramen? That's created by your sacrotuberous and your sacrospinous ligament. Our piriformis muscle is a really big structure that passes through here. And that goes from the anterior sacrum and attaches all the way to the greater trochanter. And this splits this foramen into two smaller spaces. We've got the supra piriform foramen because it's superior to the piriformis, and we've got the infrapiriform foramen, which is inferior to the piriformis. And you should know what passes through these. I hope it's not too hard to remember. In your suprapiriform foramen, you've got your superior gluteal nerve artery and vein, which go towards your gluteus medius and minimus. And in your infrapiriform foramen, you've got your inferior gluteal nerve artery and vein, which go towards your gluteus maximus muscle. But the most important nerve to know would be the sciatic nerve, which runs through your infrapiriform foramen. Um, there are lots of other nerves here. I wouldn't worry too much about them, but I'd have an idea about what passes through. The lesser sciatic foramen is less important. Um, the pedendal and the internal pedendal artery and vein pass through here, as well as the greater sciatic foramen, but these come back in second year. So I wouldn't worry too much about them. We've also got the obturator foramen. This is already formed in part of the bone. And um, we've got an obturator membrane that covers most of this hole. And then within your obturator membrane, there's a little gap here. 
and that's the obturator canal. And this contains your obturator nerve, artery and vein. And so it, it provides a little highway for these to get to the medial part of your leg. The next space is the femoral triangle. This is on the anterior part of your thigh. Um, and I would definitely know the borders of this. So the superior border is the inguinal ligament. The lateral border is the medial part of your sartorius muscle. Remember that's on the anterior compartment of your leg. Our lateral border, sorry, our lateral border is the medial sartorius. Our medial border is the medial part of the adductor longus. And this forms part of the floor as well as the iliopsoas muscle and the pectineus muscle. And our roof is our fascia lata. Also, you should really know the contents of this triangle. I use the mnemonic navel to help me remember things from lateral to medial. So we've got N for the femoral nerve, femoral artery, B for vein, E for empty space, and L for limp. And also know that everything here, except for the femoral nerve, travel together in a sheath. And this area here is quite important, clinically important for some procedures, such as a femoral nerve block, because by, looking, by identifying where the inguinal ligament is, you can find the femoral nerve right underneath the midpoint of that. Okay, the next space is a bit lower down. It's your adductor canal. So if you remember, the adductor magnus is one of your hip adductors, so it's in the medial part of your thigh. And there's a little gap here, which is called the adductor hiatus. And we basically need a way for our vessels to get from the femoral triangle all the way to the medial part of the thigh to the back of the leg. And so there's a canal that forms from the apex of the femoral triangle all the way to this adductor hiatus. And this is called the adductor canal. So the borders of it, anteriorly is the sartorius muscle, laterally is the vastus medialis muscle, medially is the adductor longus muscle and the adductor magnus muscle, and your roof is the aponeurosis. And this contains a lot of the continuations from the femoral triangle such as the femoral artery, the femoral nerve, and the saphitis nerve, which is a branch of the femoral nerve. Next, we've got the popliteal fossa. This is on the back of the knee. So your borders, your superior borders will be your hamstring muscles. Your inferior borders would be the two heads of your gastrocnemius muscle, and your roof will be your popliteal fascia and your skin. And as with any other space, these contain a lot of nerves and arteries and other vessels. So we've got the popliteal artery, which is often quite deep, but you can still palpate it to find your popliteal pulse. We've got our popliteal vein, our tibial nerve, and also our common fibular nerve. So these, our sciatic nerves divides right above here into both of these branches. And our common fibular nerve runs right along the edge of the biceps femoris tendon. Since it's quite superficial, it has a risk of being damaged. Okay, and the last space I wanted to talk about would be the tarsal tunnel. This is on the medial side of the foot and it's really similar to the carpal tunnel um, in your hand. So remember, in your hand, this is covered by the flexor retinaculum because your hand can flex like that. The same, it's similar for the tarsal tunnel. Um, your roof would be your flexor retinaculum and your floor would be a few of your bones. So to remember the contents of these, there's the mnemonic Tom, Dick and Very Naughty Hanny, Harry, and that stands for your tibialis posterior tendon, your flexor digitorum longus tendon, your posterior tibial artery, posterior tibial vein, your tibial nerve and your flexor hallucis longus tendon. And you can get something very similar to carpal tunnel syndrome, but this is tarsal tunnel syndrome, where you get the compression of the tibial nerve as it passes through this area. Okay, so now I've done all the spaces, I'm gonna talk about the neurovasculature. Firstly, for the nerves, they all come from the lumbar sacral plexus and it's really complicated compared to the brachial plexus. So you don't need to know this in as much detail as you did with the brachial plexus. You don't need to know all of the roots and every single thing that branches off it. Instead, I've listed a bunch of the important nerves. We've already been through some of them already um, like the superior and the inferior gluteal nerve. But the main ones you should definitely know the course of and what they innovate would be the femoral, obturator, and the branches of the sciatic nerve. And also know their nerve roots. 
So I'm going to go through the course of all of these nerves as I do think this is quite important. Starting with your femoral nerve, um, that starts from your lumbosacral plexus. It pierces your psoas major muscle and it passes underneath the midpoint of your inguinal canal. Don't know why there's a question mark there, but passes underneath the midpoint of your inguinal canal into the femoral triangle and it divides into your anterior and your posterior divisions. From your posterior division, you get your saphenous nerve. This is purely a sensory nerve and this travels through the adductor canal, so from the femoral triangle in this direction here, but it doesn't actually exit through the adductor hiatus because it doesn't want to go to the back of the knee. Instead, it'll go towards the medial leg and provide sensory innervation there. So to think about what this nerve innervates, you just think about where it goes. This passed over the anterior thigh, so it's going to innervate all your muscles in that area. So most of your hip flexors and your knee extensors. Okay. And since this passes underneath the inguinal ligaments here, it can be compressed when traveling under there. And it can also be damaged, um, your saphenous nerve can be damaged during surgery of the saphenous vein. Next, we've got the obturator nerve. Again, that runs through your psoas major. And remember that your obturator canal is quite medial towards all the other spaces and openings. So this provides it um, a way to get to the medial thigh and it's going to innervate all the muscles of the medial thigh. As well as that, it's also going to provide a little bit of sensory innervation to your medial thigh. And to think about what could damage this nerve, just think about anything that happens in this area. So any kind of trauma in this area could damage the nerve, but the most common things would be pelvic and abdominal surgery. Okay, we've got our sciatic nerve. Remember that this passes through the back of your leg underneath the piriformis and it runs deep to the long head of the biceps femoris. So that kind of explains why it innervates all of these muscles because it runs so close there. And then it bifurcates at the apex of your popliteal fossa. Remember that's at the back of your knee. So your sciatic nerve innervates all of your posterior thigh muscles, so your hamstrings, and it doesn't provide any sensory innervation. One of the branches of the sciatic nerve is the tibial nerve. So this starts from the apex of the popliteal fossa. And first of all, it gives off a branch that combines with a branch of the common fibular nerve. This is called the serral nerve, and this is a sensory nerve. Um, anyway, the tibial nerve will continue to travel down the back of the leg, and you can see that it heads medial here. And if you remember, that's the tarsal tunnel, that's on the medial side of the leg. So it passes through there, and as soon as it does that, it'll give up the medial and lateral plantar nerves. So as for what this innervates, although your tibial nerve runs quite medially and your common fibular nerve is lateral because your fibula is the lateral bone, their branches that um, come off together, the serral nerve, would give um, sensory innervation to the lateral side of the leg. And your medial nerve also gives, sorry, your, tib your medial and your lateral plantar nerves also give innervation to the base of your foot. Okay, and lastly, we've got the common fibular nerve. Again, this branches off your sciatic nerve at the apex of the popliteal fossa. This wraps around the head of the fibula, sorry, the neck of the fibula. And this is quite important because if we get fractures to this area, we can risk damaging that nerve. And then it splits into the deep and superficial branches. The deep branch is the more anterior branch, so that's going to innervate all of your anterior leg muscles, which are your dorsiflexes. And it's going to end all the way here around the webbing of your first and your second toe. So that explains why it gives a little bit of sensory innervation there. Whereas your superficial nerve, that runs on the lateral side of your leg. So it's going to give innervation to all of your lateral muscles, the ones that are responsible for foot eversion. And since it's more superficial, Compared to the deep nerve, I use that to remind me that this has more sensory innervation. So it's going to innervate most of your leg, especially the lateral side, except for that little part um, with the toe webbing between the first and the second toe that's covered by the deep fibular nerve. So I really find it helps to um, imagine tracing these out in yourself or draw diagrams to remember the course of these. Next, let's quickly talk about the arteries of the lower limb. Um, so these come from the abdominal aorta 
and that splits into your left and your right common iliac arteries and off your common iliac arteries you've got your external iliac and your internal iliac artery. Your internal iliac artery supplies your pelvis but I don't have time to go through this today. I would definitely learn some of the important branches such as the external and the internal and the obturator artery. Sorry, I'm an external and internal iliac artery. Um, but you'll learn more about this in second year. Anyway, so the external iliac artery is responsible for the arterial supply of the rest, your whole lower limb, basically. So let's trace this down. It travels down this way. And as soon as it goes underneath the inguinal ligament, it becomes the femoral artery. And if we follow the femoral artery down, it gives off a branch called the profunda femoris artery. Profunda means deep. So this, lies, this runs quite deep in your thigh and really close to the shaft of the femur. So if we get any shaft of femur fractures, you risk damage of this artery. The profunda femoris artery also has a number of branches. An important one would be the medial circumflex artery which wraps around the neck of the femur, and that's important for fractures in that area as well. So if we look at the, um, if we continue with the femoral artery, it's on the anterior part of your thigh. But I hope you guys know that we've also got a popliteal artery, which is on the back of your thigh. So your artery somehow has to travel from the front of your leg to the back, and that's where the adductor hiatus comes in useful, because as soon as it passes underneath there, it'll become your popliteal artery. Okay, and then continuing with your popliteal artery, that gives off your anterior tibial artery as well as your tibioperineal trunk. Suggested by its name, your tibioperineal trunk is going to give off your tibial artery, which is more medial, and your fibular artery, which is more lateral, just because your fibular bone is lateral. And your anterior tibial artery will continue down to your dorsalis pedis artery, um, good landmark for this would be the extensor hallucis longus tendon. This artery lies lateral to that tendon in most people, but not everyone. So that's quite a good tendon for, um, for knowing where to palpate the pulse. Okay, so looking at the posterior tibial artery, again, it runs quite medial with the tibial nerve. And remember that that's where the tarsal tunnel is again. And very similar to the nerve, this is where your posterior tibial artery was split into the medial and the lateral plantar branches. Lastly, your dorsalis pedis and your lateral plantar artery will anastomose, so they combine to form a deep plantar arch, and that gives innovation to your foot. So I find it really helpful to draw diagrams to remember these. Your veins are, I would say, the less important, but I would still know them. These are really similar to the major arteries. So if you know your arteries, it'd um, really help with learning the venous drainage. So firstly, where arteries go from proximal to distal, veins go backwards because they're bringing black, um, blood back to the heart. So let's start from the foot. We've got the plantar side and the back of the foot. So on the bottom, we've got the medial and lateral plantar veins. And on the back, we've got our dorsal venous arch. So for where these drain into the leg, just think logically about where something can go. If we're starting on the back of the foot, it's going to go to the front of the leg. So your dorsal veins are going to drain to your anterior tibial vein, whereas your plantar veins are going to drain to your posterior tibial vein and your fibular vein on the back of your leg. And all three of these drain into, drain into your popliteal vein, which then drains into your femoral vein and then into the external iliac vein. So that just follows the course of your major arteries. For your superficial veins, we've got the great saphenous vein and the small saphenous vein. The great saphenous vein is longer and it runs quite closely with the saphenous nerve. If you remember, that innervates the medial part of your leg um, for sensory innervation. So your saphenous, um, your great saphenous vein will run anterior to your medial malleolus and up the medial side of the leg to drain into the femoral vein. Whereas your short saphenous vein will run um, along the back of the leg, so posterior to the lateral malleolus, and that drains into the popliteal vein. Okay, so that was a lot, but that's basically all the main nerves and veins and arteries that you need to know. So now we're going to talk about some clinical significance of things. So 
So starting with the hip um, and the main bone we have of the thigh, thigh is the femur. So can you have a look at this and have a think about what's happening here? And before I like to look at any kind of imaging picture, think about the view, the region and the modality to help orientate ourselves. So this is an AP view of the pelvis and it's an X-ray. And comparing these two femoral heads, we can see that this one here um, looks a bit shorter. So there's a femoral neck fracture here. So for femoral fractures, there are two important areas that your femur can be fractured. Um, for femoral neck fractures, remember that we've got um, of a profunda femoris artery, there's a medial femoral circumflex artery. I use circumflex to remind me that it circles around the neck of the femur. This also gives off retinacular branches that supply the head of the femur from distal to proximal. So if you get a fracture in this area, you risk tearing these branches. And because um, the blood supply to the head of the femur is backwards from distal to proximal, we risk a vascular necrosis of the femoral head because we can completely cut off its blood supply. As for femoral shaft fractures, um, if you get a fracture around about here, you could damage the profunda femoris artery since it runs quite closely to that. Um, next, we've got the muscles of the gluteal region. I said I wouldn't go through muscles, but I thought I would just go through about how I like to visualize these. Um, the tensor fascia lata isn't very important, so I put that in the corner. But if you know where all of these muscles sit, you can kind of guess what the action would be by picturing each muscle like a string and contracting that muscle is like pulling the string shorter. So if you imagine contracting the gluteus maximus, the muscle is going to move in this direction and then it's going to pull your femur backwards, therefore causing extension. Whereas for your gluteus medius and minimus, contracting those muscles would pull your femur this way, causing it to move upwards, and that's how you get abduction. And for the innervation, these are all gluteal muscles, so they're all innervated by their gluteal nerves. We know that we've got the superior and the inferior gluteal nerve. Your gluteus medius and minimus lie higher up, so they're innervated by the superior gluteal nerve, whereas your gluteus maximus is innervated by the inferior gluteal nerve. Okay, so some important clinical applications of this. We often give intramuscular gluteal injections in this region, but we have to be careful to avoid the sciatic nerve because it's quite a big nerve and it gives off a lot of important branches. If we damage it, we're going to have a lot of effects. So remember that this travels through the infrapiriform foramen, so it lies in the lower medial quadrant. So we use the gluteus um, maximus as a landmark to avoid and instead we aim to put our injection into the gluteus medius area or if we don't know where these muscles are we just aim for the upper lateral quadrant. Another thing would be Trendelenburg sign which indicates weakness of our hip abductors. So this is the test, I hope you remember it from ClinSkills, it's where you ask the patient to stand on one leg and you can try this yourself. Normally if you ask anyone with functioning muscles to stand on one leg, the pelvis should be level like this. But if it drops, that indicates that there's a problem with this muscle here because your abductors can't lift up the other side of your pelvis. So this hip drop in the left indicates that we've got weak right gluteus medius and minimus muscles. And this is often due to a superior gluteal nerve pathology. Okay, we've also got our deep muscles. I'm not gonna go through these in much detail. Um, their nerve innervation, hopefully you can tell by their name. The only different ones would be your superior and inferior gemellus. They're just innervated by the muscle, the nerve to the muscles directly underneath. Also note that all of these muscles, except for the quadratus femoris, is attached to the greater trochanter of your femur. So when they contract, they pull the head of your femur into the acetabulum and it helps keep your hip stable and prevents dislocation. So they're quite important muscles. But the most important I would say would be the piriformis muscle. Um, not only does this muscle travel through the greater sciatic foramen, 
and split that space into your suprapuriform and your infrapuriform foramen. But since this runs so closely to the sciatic nerve, um, if you get any hypertrophy or spasm of this muscle, we can compress the sciatic nerve and this can cause sciatica, which is basically pain radiating, radiating down the back of your leg because that's the path where the sciatic nerve runs. And we call this piriformis syndrome. Okay, muscles of the thigh. Um, this is where it's really important to know the names of each muscle and what compartment they belong to because generally, not all of these are innervated by the femoral nerve, but most are and they all have a similar movement. Really unique one would be the sartorius. That um, attaches from the anterior superior iliac spine all the way to the medial tibia. So if we can imagine that contracting, it's going to flex at the hip joint, but also at the knee joint. And it's the only muscle in the anterior thigh compartment that flexes two joints. So it's quite interesting there. A medial compartment, I'm not gonna go through these. A posterior compartment are our hamstrings. Note that these all proximally attach to the ischial tuberosity, and this can be a problem during hamstring tears. So if we're doing a lot of running and kicking sports, we're using our hamstring muscles a lot, and this can lead to a muscle strain, which is basically where we get tearing of that muscle. But if we do a lot of um, a sudden powerful contraction and a stretching of the hamstring, since they all attach to the same spot here on the ischial tuberosity, you can get what we call an avulsion fracture, where we actually tear off a fragment of the bone. And that can be um, quite dangerous. Okay, an important area, this is more an important area of the knee, don't really know where I put it in here, but this is the pes anserinus. It's also called the goose foot because it looks like one. And this is the point where three muscle tendons attach to the tibia. And they're all tendons from different compartments. We've got the sartorius, the gracilis, and the semitendinosus muscle. We'll definitely know these. And the one main clinical application is that we often get bursitis in this area because there are so many tendons in such a small area. We get a lot of contraction and a lot of movement and friction here that can cause inflammation. I already talked about the adductor canal before. And I remember that the vastus medialis is on the lateral side, is your lateral border to the canal. So we can get adductor canal compression syndrome, and that's where if we get hypertrophy of this muscle, this can compress on your nerves and your veins and your arteries here. So to think about the effects, we just think about what runs through this canal and what do they do? So we've got the femoral artery, that's basically the blood supply to the rest of your leg. So if we block off this blood supply, we're going to get less blood going to our legs and this can present with cortication, which is pain in your calves when walking. And remember your saphenous nerve provides sensory innervation to your medial leg, so we can get tingling, numbness and pain in that area there. Okay, now for some questions. A woman stands on her right leg and her left hip drops downwards. This could be explained by insufficient contraction of which muscle? This would be the right gluteus medius. Remember, because if our left hip drops downwards, then that tells us that we've got um, insufficient contraction of the weight of the muscle on the weight bearing leg. A 20 year old footballer is tackled heavily and is subsequently diagnosed with a posteriorly dislocated hip. He complains of an inability to move part of his right lower limb. Of the following, the muscle most likely to have had its nerve supply affected is, So this would be the biceps femoris. If we've got posterior dislocation, just think about which nerve is posterior. Your sciatic nerve is posterior and these innervate the hamstrings and your biceps femoris is one of them. Your rectus femoris is in your anterior compartment, so that's probably not going to be damaged. Um, your adductor longus and your gracilis, they're innervated by your obturator nerve. So again, that's not really in the same area. And your solus major is a bit too high up. To be damaged by that. 
the anterior compartment of the thigh. This one here is E. So just remember that we've also got the sartorius in this compartment and that flexes the knee, whereas all of your other quad muscles would extend your knee. Okay, so now let's talk about the knee. We've got a lot of structures here. Um, firstly, have a think about what's happening here. So this is an AP view of the knee and it's an X-ray. Normally our patella should be around about the middle part of the knee, but we can see that it's moved towards the lateral side. This is the lateral side because we've got the fibula here and that's our lateral bone. So this is lateral dislocation of the patella. So patella dislocation can occur when we get sudden flexion and external rotation of our knee. And it's more likely to dislocate laterally because our vastus medialis muscle is the only muscle that pulls this in the medial direction. So it's quite weak. Um, and it's also more likely to occur, occur in females because they've got a wider Q angle. That's just the angle between the femur and the tibia here. So it's more likely to push the patella in the lateral direction. Okay, now for important structures of the knee, we've got a lot of these and you will need to know all of them. So let's quickly go through these with another quiz. So firstly, we've got this. This, these attach from your medial and your lateral condyles into the part in between your condyles of your tibia. So this is the intercondylar fossa. They will be your anterior and your posterior cruciate ligaments. These ones here are on the side. So they attach from your epicondyles. These are your collateral ligaments. We've got the medial one and the lateral collateral ligament. And lastly, we've got our menisci. So the medial meniscus and the lateral meniscus. So our anterior cruciate ligament is much weaker than our posterior cruciate ligament. So it's much more likely to be torn. And this prevents anterior displacement of the tibia and hyperextension. And this is often caused by sudden changes in direction and sudden stopping. So if we had to test whether the integrity of this ligament. Um, there's a test called the anterior draw sign. That's just where you sit on the patient's foot and you try to pull the tibia backwards. And if you get a lot of movement of that, that tells us that this ligament has been torn. Similarly for the posterior cruciate ligament, it prevents posterior displacement of the tibia. Um, and it's often caused in a car crash where your knee slams the car dashboard and pushes it backwards. That's why we call it a dashboard injury. And to test this, we try pushing on the patient's tibia. And so if we get movement there, that would suggest that we've got a torn posterior cruciate ligament. Next, we've got our collateral ligaments. So these stop your knees from moving medially and laterally. So here are your normal knees. Our medial collateral ligaments are on the side here. So if we get a lateral blow to the knees, it's going to push our knees in this way and it's going to stretch that ligament, possibly tearing that ligament. And if it does, then we're going to get um, a valgus deformity. For our lateral collateral ligaments, these can be damaged by a medial blow to the knee, um, which rips your lateral ligaments there. And this is present with a varus deformity. Your, it's more likely that you would tear your medial collateral ligaments just because it's more likely you're going to get hit from something um, laterally rather than medially. Okay, we've got our menisci. These are a fibrocartilage structure and their main function is to increase the area of your knee joint to absorb the force and increase the stability of this joint. So a key word here is twisting. They're often torn by squatting and twisting of the knees. If we compare the medial meniscus to the lateral meniscus, the medial one is attached to the medial collateral ligament, whereas the lateral meniscus isn't. This makes the medial meniscus less mobile and more common to tear, more commonly torn. And also, if we get 
tearing of our medial collateral ligament, we often get tearing of our medial meniscus as well. So for how these present, we get pain on medial rotation for tearing of our medial meniscus and pain on lateral rotation for when we tear our lateral meniscus. We've got bursa of the knee. So these are basically fluid filled sacs that cushion your bones and your tendons. These aren't all of them. Um, you don't need to know all of them. And you can guess where they are based on their name. For example, the suprapatellar bursa is above the patella, the prepatellar bursa is on the patella, and the infrapatellar bursa is below the patella. And we can commonly get bursitis, which is inflammation due to excess force and friction between these. And two important ones would be housemaid's knee, which causes prepatellar bursa, bursitis. Um, commonly because housemaid's knee, housemaid's kneel on the part um, below the patella and sorry, the part on the patella and your clergyman's knee, which is infrapatellar bursitis because men kneeling like that get a lot of friction in that area. Okay, so I already talked about the popliteal fossa, but I didn't talk about what would happen if we saw a mass there. So you're going to need to identify um, have a think about what could this be. So we could either get a cold non-pulsatile mass or a warm pulsatile mass. Um, when I see pulsatile, I think about um, something pumping through there and it'll most likely be blood. So the most common cause of a warm pulsatile mass would be a popliteal aneurysm. So an aneurysm is basically where you've got weak arterial walls and so all of the blood pumping through, they will end up dilating these walls. And that's how we get a warm mass form in that area. Whereas your cold mass would be your Baker's cyst. Um, remember our knee joint is a synovial joint. So we've got synovial fluid in there and that can leak into your popliteal fossa and cause a cold non-pulsatile mass. Okay, now for some questions. Which of these structures doesn't pass through the popliteal fossa? Got the popliteal nerve for that, it just doesn't exist, the rest of them do. Okay, a patient presents to the emergency department complaining that his below knee plaster is too tight. You suspect that the plaster is pressing on which of the following nerves? So here, this would be your common perineal nerve. So remember, below your knee, that's the popliteal fossa. The two main nerves that run through here would be your tibial nerve and your common fibular nerve. Because your common fibular nerve is very superficial, as it runs next to the tendon of your biceps femoris, it's prone to um, damage in this area. Um, your sciatic nerve is higher up, so that's not in the same area and your lateral cutaneous nerve in the thigh is not in the right area as well, and your saphenous nerve runs um, more medially in your leg. While playing rugby, a 19-year-old college student receives a twisting injury to his knee when being tackled from the lateral side. Which of the following conditions most likely has occurred? So this here would be a tear of the medial meniscus. A key word here would be twisting. Whenever I like to hear twisting, I think about the meniscus. Um, but if we get a blow from the lateral side, it's also more com it's more likely to tear our medial collateral ligaments. And remember that since these are connected together, we're going to get the tear of our medial meniscus as well. For the other ones, the fibular collateral ligament is the same thing as the lateral collateral ligament, and that would be torn by a blow to the medial side. Um, tibialis anterior muscles in your leg, so that's probably not going to be damaged. Your posterior cruciate ligament, again, is unlikely, and so is your pes anserhinus. That's just the spot 
on your medial tibia where all your tendons join. Okay. So lastly, let's just talk about the leg, ankle, and the foot. Firstly, um, we've got the bones of the leg, the tibia, and the fibula. I hope you guys know that the fibula is more lateral, but I use T equals big toe to remind myself that the tibia is the more medial bone. An important part about the fibula is that your common fibula nerve wraps around the neck of your fibula. So if we get a fracture to this area, this can damage this nerve. And this most commonly presents as foot drop. That's basically where if you see someone with damage to this nerve lift up their leg when they're walking, they're not going to be able to dorsiflex their foot. And that's because a branch of the common fibular nerve is your deep fibular nerve, which innervates the anterior compartment of your leg. So they're your dorsiflexes. And so they have to lift their leg up higher when they're walking just to get their whole foot off the ground. So they often present with this high steppage gait. Um, learn the bones of the foot and also learn how to see them on an x-ray from the front and also from the side. Yeah. Okay. So we can get ankle fractures. These are called POTS fractures and these are often fractures of your medial and your lateral malleolus. So a bimalleolar fracture is where you get a fracture of your medial and your lateral malleolus. Whereas a trimalleolar fracture is where you get a fracture of your medial lateral malleolus and part of your distal tibia. We can classify these fractures based on where they are um, in relation to this fibrous joint between the distal fibula and tibia. And this is called the tibiofibular syndesmosis. So a type A fracture is where we get a fracture below this point. And this is often caused by adduction on an inverted foot. A type B fracture is where we get a fracture at the level, the same level as this tibiofibular syndesmosis. And that's often caused by externally rotating um, our inverted foot. And our type C fracture would be something that happens above there. And that's often caused by an externally rotating force on an everted foot. The one that's the most unstable would be your type A fracture. And that's because that leaves a part of your fibula bone that isn't connected to the tibia at all. Whereas these ones here, your bones are still connected um, via this ligament here. Okay, muscles of the leg. Um, as we get lower down, hopefully you notice the same with your upper limb. You can kind of tell what these muscles do and where they're attached based on their name. So, Digitorum just refers to the lateral four toes. Longus means that it's long, so this extends those four toes. And halicis means the big toe. Okay, lateral compartment. Um, these evert the foot. To remember the difference between foot inversion and eversion, I like to think that inversion is turning your soles in, whereas eversion is the opposite. Okay, and out of these, probably your posterior, your superficial posterior muscles are the most important. We've got our triceps serrae muscles. They're formed by your gastrocnemius muscle and your soleus muscle. It's called triceps because you've got two heads to your gastrocnemius, so three muscles total. And these all um, attach distally to the calcaneal tendon, which is also called the Achilles tendon. And if you pull on this muscle here, you get plantar flexion of the foot. And we've also got our deep muscles and based on their name, you can tell where they are on the leg as well. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about would be a um, calcaneal tendon rupture. So remember this muscle here helps us plantar flex our foot. So if we do the opposite motion, if we dorsiflex our foot, it's going to stretch this tendon here. And if we do it, if we do it, if we have extreme dorsiflexion of our plantar flexed foot, it has the chance of completely ripping this whole tendon. If this is ripped, then our muscles no longer attach to anything. So if we contract this, it's not going to move. Um, it's not going to plantar flex our foot at all. We're also going to have an absent ankle jerk reflex. Again, it's another special test of our MSK lower limb examination. That's where you ask the patient to. Um, lie down on their stomach on the bed and you get them to lift up their leg and you squeeze their calf. And as that happens, that's going to slightly plantar flex 
the foot because you're slightly contracting your triceps serrae muscles. And this is how we check whether or not we've got a rupture of our Achilles tendon. And for muscles of the foot, there are so many, I think there are like four layers or something and they don't have very much clinical significance. So I wouldn't really bother with them. Unless you've really got nothing to do on your holidays, you might, but no, nah, don't really bother. Okay, here's a question now. So Tina presents to the emergency department with severe pain at the back of her right foot. Upon examination, the doctor asks her to plan to flex her foot. What position of the foot following this test would suggest that she has completely ruptured her right Achilles tendon? Yep, so this would be dorsiflexed. That's because you're unable to plantar flex your foot. And since none of your, most of your plantar um, flexing muscles aren't working, your foot also going to be in a passive dorsiflexed, dorsiflexed position. Okay, um, how much time? Just because we've got some time left, I decided to put in one of these for fun. So let's start by labeling this nerve here or maybe we can start by, I would start by identifying the anterior, the medial and the posterior compartments of your thigh. So this nerve here is really big. Remember the sciatic nerve is the biggest nerve um, in your leg. So that's going to be the sciatic nerve there, making this here the posterior compartment. Um, have a think about what this would be. The other branches of your nerve would be the femoral nerve because um, they travel near the medial part of your thigh in the adductor canal. Okay, now for these muscles, these are in the anterior compartment. So the most anterior one is your rectus femoris and these here would be your vastus muscles. So your vastus intermedius and your vastus lateralis. And lastly, we've got our posterior muscles. These are our hamstring muscles. And see if you remember um, all four of them. Well, technically three. Okay, so that would be your semimembranosus, your semitendinosus, and your biceps femoris. Um, remember your biceps femoris is the more lateral one. Okay, and lastly, um, this one here is pointing to this big muscle here. The other compartment of muscles we haven't been through would be your medial muscles. Have a think about what that one would be. Yep, this one here is the adductor magnus because it's quite a large muscle there. Um, the other ones I didn't go through were the adductor longus and your gracilis muscle. They're a lot smaller, so I just like to think this one here is so big. And we're in a pretty, um, in like the middle of our thigh. Okay, so that's all I had for you guys. Did anyone have any questions? If not, um, feel free to email me or stalk me on Facebook if you do. Thanks.